Good morning. Our scripture this morning is taken from the Gospel of John, chapter number 8, beginning at verse number 12. Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. The Pharisees replied, you are making those claims about yourself. Such testimony is not valid. Jesus told them, these claims are valid even though I'm making them about myself. For I know where I came from and where I'm going. But you don't know this about me. You judge me by human standards, but I do not judge anyone. And if I did, my judgment would be correct in every respect because I am not alone. The Father who sent me is with me. Your own law says that if two people agree about something, their witness is accepted as fact. I am one witness and my Father who sent me is the other. Where is your Father, they asked. Jesus answered, since you don't know who I am, you don't know who my father is. If you knew me, you would also know my father. Jesus made these statements while he was teaching in the section of the temple known as, his, as the treasury, but he was not arrested because his time had not yet come. The word of God for the people of God.
glad to see everyone out there. Yes, I do see you. I hear you and I pray for you. To God be the glory this morning for all that he has done. This morning as we prepare to go into our opening prayer for service this morning, I pray that you would be praying with me um, as we look to the Lord, as we go to the throne of grace and we seek his face. Today, let's begin to pray for the power of the Holy Spirit to fall fresh upon us, to fall fresh upon our households, to fall fresh upon our church, to fall fresh upon everything that concerns us. The Lord tells us that he will perfect those things that concerns us. And so tonight, today, this moment, this time, we're going to look to the Lord. Come, let us pray together. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mm, glory to God. Father, you are so awesome. You are so great and so mighty. You are the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth. Sovereign and holy God. Righteous God. Merciful God. The God that is full of compassion and full of love the God that protects, the God that keeps, the God that provides, the God that gives, the God that covers, the God mm, of our salvation. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. Oh God, we bless your name today, oh God, and we humbly come before you, oh God, seeking out you, oh God, yielding to the sovereignty of your holiness, oh Lord. Father, we need you like never before to come in, oh God, and do a work in us. Sanctify us, oh God. Anoint us, oh God. Prepare us, oh Lord God, to worship you in spirit and in truth, oh God. To come before your holy throne, oh God. That this service, oh God, would worship you, Lord, like never before. Oh God, we lift up a praise unto you, oh God. We lift up thanksgiving unto you, oh God, because you have been so good to us, oh God, for you are good and your mercy endureth forever. The Lord is good and his mercy endureth forever. So Lord, we bless your holy name, oh God. We thank you, oh Lord, for the privilege to be able to come before you and to pray. Oh God, you have given us the privilege, the opportunity, oh God, to open up our mouths and say, thank you, Jesus. 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 Oh God, you are so good unto us, oh Lord, and we bless your holy name. So Father, right now, Lord God, we come before you. Cleanse us from any unrighteousness, oh God. Purify us right now. Sanctify us and prepare us, oh Lord, to do your will, oh God, which is to bless your name to praise you, to worship you, and to honor you. Oh God, we love you so. We love you so, oh God. And we pray right now, Lord, in the name of Jesus, touch us, breathe upon us, set the atmosphere wherever we are, oh God, that your spirit, oh God, will permeate, oh Lord, and that you would begin to do a work not only in us, oh God, but in everyone and everything around us. For when we call on the name of Jesus, everything must bow. So we have no worries. We have no concerns. We will not be anxious, oh God, but we will give it all unto you. You tell us you will keep us in perfect peace when our minds are stayed on you. So God, right now, oh God, we yield to you every burden, every worry, every concern, oh God, and we loose, oh God, your love, your peace, your joy, your patience, your kindness, your goodness, your self-control, your fruit, oh God, shall come forth from us because we follow you, oh Lord. So God, even right now, we're expecting, oh God, we're opening ourselves up for your spirit to minister to us. That as the word comes forth, oh God, it would touch. It will do a work. Oh God, it will change things within us. Oh God, we're so grateful. So thankful. 
we bless your holy name. We give you all honor. We give you all praise. We give you all glory. And it is in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Glory to God. Give God some praise right now, for he is worthy of praise. Even right now, you know you can be thankful for what God has done for you. So lift up your hands and give him a shout of praise. Worship his holy name in this place. We love you, oh God, in the name of Jesus. Amen, amen, and amen.
to our guest and friends, Pastor Senior here, uh, continuing in the I Am series that we started on last week. Uh, Jesus is the most uh, influential individual to have ever walked the earth, um, and it's not even close. Uh, there's no one alive or dead that has had a greater imp impact on the trajectory and course of human history uh, than Jesus Christ. He is hated, debated, discussed, disparaged, celebrated, and jeered. Uh, but one thing he is not, and that is ignored. Uh, whatever your opinion or thoughts of him, chances are you have one. And because Jesus has such a high profile, uh, down through the centuries, you have a number of people that have stepped forward as representatives for him. And when you have as many representatives as Jesus has, uh, then you also are going to have a lot of folks that misrepresent you. And so as we are preparing to celebrate the anniversary of the Lord's Passion, um, what is traditionally known as Easter, uh, we want to spend the next several weeks talking about who the historic Jesus is, uh, but having this conversation utilizing his own words. You say, how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to examine the gospel of John. John was a friend, fan, follower, and biographer of Christ. In fact, John says that the whole reason for him writing his gospel was to show that Jesus of Nazareth was Christ, the son of God, and that believers in him might have eternal life. And so in other words, John, friend, fan, follower, biographer of Jesus, wrote this so that it would bring Jesus within reach of everyone who has a desire to know him. Now in his gospel, John recorded seven claims that Jesus made about himself. Each of these claims begins with the words, I am. Now, these I am statements are in some cases symbolic or metaphorical. Others are statements of fact. But all of his statements paint a picture of who Jesus is. So last week, after feeding 5,000 people, Jesus described himself as the bread of life, not just sent by the Father to nourish the physical needs of people, but also to nourish their very souls. And now this week, as we fast forward, the people are celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles. Now during the feast, there were four huge lamps that were lit uh, in the tabernacle in an area called the Court of Women. Uh, this was an, a, a part of the outer court of the tabernacle or the temple. Uh, the temple. And so uh, during this time, uh, you'd have men with torches. It was a celebration. There'd be music and singing and dancing um, all through the night, right? So get that visual, you know, these four huge lamps, men with these, these torches, um, and then folks singing and dancing all night. Um, and it's in that, with that backdrop, uh, that Jesus declares that he is the light of of the world, right? That's, I guess that would be their version of almost like a laser light show. And it is in that context that Jesus declares that he is the light of the world. Now, this isn't the only thing that's happening in this text. This week, Jesus is also going to forgive a woman um, that has been exposed or caught in the act of adultery uh, right before he goes on to heal a man that was born blind, right? And so you've got uh, Jesus forgiving this woman. You've got him healing this blind man, all while celebrating, um, you know, during the celebration of light, then Jesus declares himself the light of the world, right? And so what is Jesus getting at? What does he mean when he says, when he declares that he is the light of the world. Well, we know that he's using metaphorical language, right? That is, he is taking physical objects and things 
to help people visualize spiritual concepts and principles, right? And so think about what light represents uh, for the human experience. Generally speaking, and this isn't all that light uh, means to us or even all of the ways that we define and understand light, but generally speaking, light helps our eyes to see, right? That is one of the most fundamental functions of life in our world, right? It helps us to see. And then seeing helps us to navigate, right? And then navigation allows for mobility. And then mobility allows us to connect with resources. So in many ways, light begins as revelation, but then revelation leads to edification, right? That that it's not, light is not an end to itself or seeing isn't an end to itself, but that when light, when we have light and we're able to see, then seeing allows us to navigate and navigation allows mobility and mobility allows us to connect with resources. So stick a pin in that. Another way that we can think about light is that light helps us to see things with greater clarity. And when we're able to see things more clearly, our understanding, uh, our understanding is transformed by our seeing, right? That when we see things with clarity and we can better understand uh, those things by the seeing, uh, then that understanding transforms how we are in the world, right? Because now we see ourselves more clearly in the world. And so it's in that context when Jesus talks about he is light and not only light, but he is light that leads to life, right? He is the light that gives life. We understand that by his light, we move, right? That, that when God gives us revelation through the ministry of Christ, he moves us, right? We, we, we get, remember what I said, light gives us the opportunity to see. Seeing helps us to navigate. Navigation gives us mobility. Mobility allows us to connect with resources. By, by being able to see because of the light provided by Christ, it allows us to connect with God's divine resources, which moves us towards light, right? He moves us from death to life. Uh, <clears throat> and we see this even more clearly in the context in which Jesus spoke these words, right? So for example, uh, right, as I said to you earlier, right before Jesus declares himself to be the light of the world, if you read the passage above that statement, you'll see that, um, you know, sort of a famous situation. Some of you may be familiar. Uh, there's this woman who's been caught in the act of adultery, and you have this group of Pharisees and scribes that drag her before Jesus wanting to, you know, sort of get Jesus to condemn her and have her stoned. Um, and this is, a, 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 in part, a plot to try and undermine Jesus's reputation with the people, right? It's almost like a no-win situation. But as they are disparaging this woman, uh, Jesus is there kneeling down, drawing something in the dirt. After he hears what they have to say, his response is basically this. Uh, Whoever is without sin cast the first stone, right? If though he, you without sin, cast the first stone. And it says in the text, like from the, from the oldest to the youngest or from the youngest to the oldest, they one by one started to drop their rocks and walk away, right? Um, here is this situation where you have these men that are religious, right? Um, and, and by religious, the thing we need, need, you know, we have to remember about the Jews is that the Jews, uh, in the Jew, the Jewish way of thinking, God's word was light, right? Uh, think about what the psalmist says in Psalm 119 and 105. Your word is a lamp unto my feet, right? The light of God's word reveals the path of truth so that we can live a straight life, right? That was their perception of things. But how was that going for them, right? How was that working for them? Was it just the word of God that was the light? Well, even the Gentiles, let's back up, let's back up for a second. Even the Gentiles have a similar kind of understanding or, or you know, even though, you know, people that are not 
Jew, religious per se, have a similar orientation to life, right, or to truth. The, uh, the you know, when we think about what it is to be in, in darkness, we think of darkness as a picture of ignorance. And so light is an image of truth. But how much knowledge and truth do we see circulating in the populace, but still does not necessarily lead to health or morality or righteousness, right, or compassion, right? And so there has, there's something more to it than just light. There's something more to light than just a set of facts or a collection of information, right? Which is kind of how we sometimes perceive truth, but it really is uh, deeper than that. And this is what Jesus is saying to them, that, um, that, that they, especially in this particular group, this instance where they're trying to, you know, condemn this woman, even in light of their own faults and failings, um, that it's in that context that, that he reveals that you can have truth, but truth absent of God ends up being cruel, right? It ends up being hypocritical. Um, and so, and so Jesus says, no, no, um, I am the light, right? If you're wanting to know God, um, if you're wanting to follow God, then you need to fix your gaze on me. I am the light that will lead you to truth, that will lead you to life, right? And so, and so what does that, what, what, what is he inviting them to? What is he inviting us to? Well, simply put, he's inviting us to love God and express our love for God by our love for the light, right? And who is that light? Jesus is that light. And, and often our true attitude toward God will be reflected in our personal response to the light, the light that is revealed uh, through the Lord Jesus. Think about Jesus' own words, the Gospel of John, chapter 3, uh, verse 20. And the judgment is based on this fact that God's light came into the world, but people love the darkness more than the light. Why? Because their evil, their actions were evil. And, uh, and those who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear that their sins will be exposed, right? There's an element of shame that can sometimes be wrapped up in pride, that it's not even so much the embarrassment that causes us to avoid the light of God, but it's the fact that we want to avoid, avoid the pain that comes through chastisement, right? And so, and so embrace the light. This is what he's saying to the Pharisees, to the scribes, embrace the light. Um, I think what Jesus wanted was not just for them to drop their stones, right? After he confronted them with light, right? Gave them light, he exposed them in the same way they thought, watch this, they were exposing that woman, right? He exposed them. And I think rather than just dropping their rocks, he would have preferred that they also drop the pretense, right? Just drop to your knees and to come and to worship um, because that is who he is. He is light. Um, and he wants us to shed the skin of religion and all of those other things that we sometimes use to cover up uh, ex, you know, because we don't want to be exposed. And he says, know that I am light um, and that whatever I expose, I expose it with the light uh, that does what light is supposed to do. It heals, it restores, um, it recovers. Um, the, the, the thing <clears throat> uh, about creatures of the night is that what Jesus says is that they hate light, but God has not made you to exist in darkness but he has created you to walk in his light. And so that's why John, this same John, this same apostle uh, wrote in the book of 1 John chapter one, uh, verse number five, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with God, watch this, 
While we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth, right? And so this, this issue of light, really it, it, it signals the deep fellowship and commitment that we have with God in Christ, that, that we are committed to walking in that light that God provides us through the ministry of the Lord Jesus. He says, now in verse number seven, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, the benefit we have fellowship with one another, right? Because a part of what disconnects people from one another is shame. And the only way that we can really truly overcome shame is with light. This is what he, this is the word. This is with light, allowing the light of God to illuminate, to radiate, and then eradicate whatever it is that is uh, create, uh, creating these unhealthy emotions or self-perceptions or relating with uh, the world around us and the people that are associated with us. Um, he says that when we allow ourselves to walk in that light, he says, then it contributes to our fellowship with one another, right? Going back to that woman uh, caught in the very act of adultery, right? Nothing compassionate or redemptive about anything, their approach to her, their thoughts about her. Uh, no, it's about condemnation. It's about shame. It's about guilt. It's about destruction. And what Jesus says is what you need is light. What you have is religion, but what you need is light. And I am that light. He says, and when we walk in the light, right? When you're in his light, I'm in his light, then that contributes to healthy fellowship, right? Because when we're both in the light of Jesus, not only does he expose what is wrong with us by exposing where we are broken, it also reveals our need from him, for him. And in him, we find our healing. In him, we find our redemption. In him, we find our recovery, right? And so uh, when you are in recovery and I am recovery because we are in that light, that light that not only exposes, but exfoliates, that, that heals, that, that, that conditions, right? Uh, then when you and I are both, being a, are both a part of that, that process, then it allows us to show up in community and the way that we need to show up for one another so that our relationships are redemptive um, and that we're able, even when we make mistakes, to effectively reconcile one another back uh, to truth. And he says, not only do we have fellowship with one another, but that the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. That God will only deal with what we're, uh, we're willing to allow him to expose. Think about Adam and Eve at the point of original sin. God comes looking for them. Adam, where are you? Um, he finds them. They have tried to cover their shame using artificial means. They got the fig leaves on. But God recognizes that sin is a virulent disease. It is something that sleep, that, that creeps into the DNA of humanity, right? Adam and Eve died as a result of sin entering in, and it can only be overcome through blood. And so when they, they tried to use these artificial means, plants and whatever, to cover themselves, God offered a sacrifice in the garden so that their sins could be covered so that their fellowship with him could go on, right, and not be interrupted. In the same way, God exposes us, right, that, that all, of, all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We get that from his light, the light of his word, and then the light of his word applied to our hearts through the conviction of uh, uh, wrought by the Holy Spirit, right? And so we are aware through God's word and the work of his spirit of, in many cases, just how bad a state we're in and humanity is in as a whole. But again, God isn't exposing us for our shame, he's exposing us for our gain, right? So that we can avail ourselves of the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus. Jesus shed blood, not because God is a masochist, but because sin is a virulent disease. And so he had to come and deal with a blood-borne disease through blood-borne remedy, 
So Jesus shed his blood so that you and I can have forgiveness of sin. But to participate in that forgiveness, we have to involve ourselves in the whole uh, process, which means walking in that light, being in that light so that we can see what needs to be healed and allowing God to do that work of healing. So I say again, when we look at the text today, right, um, you know, uh, the Israelites, uh, they'd always seen the light as a symbol of God's glory, an image of his perfect law, a picture of his guidance. But Jesus says that that light, all of those metaphors, all of that information, the way Paul would say is the law is a tutor that leads us to Christ, that everything in the prophets and the law points us back to Jesus. And so Jesus is the light of the world. He is the light of life, right? Bold claim, but he can back it up. And so how do we, how do we come to know Jesus in that way? Well, when Jesus was explaining this to the Pharisees, you read the text, they challenged him at every point. Um, and again, like it, it didn't matter all that they'd witnessed him do, all the things, the, the miracles and the deep teaching, you know, none of that would convince them. Uh, this is Jesus himself. If Jesus himself can't convince you, right, then there's just no convincing. Um, and so th that, that for me in some ways is encouraging because I know that there are some people that I would love if they would be able to see God in all of his glory, uh, especially through the ministry of the Lord Jesus. Uh, but there are some who just can't, um, who can't see him right? They are spiritually blind. And this is what it was with the Pharisees. Like they kept, they went, well, prove it. How do we know that you're not crazy? How do we know, you know, and Jesus is like, look, you know, I know, I know who I am. That's number one. Number two, I know that I've come to do the will of the father. I know who sent me. Um, and, and then number three, he says, and because the father sent me, don't, in, in one of the rules that you know, in order for something to be proven as true, you just need two witnesses. Well, Jesus said, well, I got my two witnesses, me and the father, right? And, and what Jesus was basically saying is there is no amount of evidence that I'm going to be able to put in front of you that's going to convince you. He's already said it in other places. And I shared this with some of you last week uh, when we were uh, at church. Uh, Jesus says, you can't come to me except the father draw you, Right. And so all of that is to say is to say this, it is not a coincidence that not long after Jesus makes this declaration, there is a man who is blind from birth that Jesus gives sight. I think that in that miracle, Jesus is also communicating something to us about the light of God, that what we need more than ever is we need the revelation of God through the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the light of God, and we need him to restore the sight of those who are desperately blind. Um, and so I'm praying for you in this season that as you are reflecting on all of Jesus's I am statements, that you are right now at this point in your life experiencing Christ as the light of God that he is illuminating the path that God has for your life, that you are able to see God clearly and walk with God faithfully, uh, that you are able to enjoy all of the, the benefit and privilege and responsibility that comes with being an heir and a joint heir with Christ, a son and a daughter of the most high God. I'm praying that in this season, that the light of God is illuminating your life and that you are not fighting or resisting or resenting that light, but that you give God glory and thanks and appreciation that he has chosen to make himself known to you and to give you a path that leads to hope and a future. Beloved, I love you. I bless God for you. Now unto him who is able to, pre to present you before him uh, faultless with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, be our, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, world without end. God bless you.